Welcome back to the Formula E Zone podcast. In today's episode, we've got some really juicy topics. We're going to be talking about a potential lap system for next season and scrapping the 45 minute system we've got this year. Is it Jean Eric Verne's championship to lose? We're going to be discussing who is in this title race with just three races to go. And silly season is in full swing. We talk driver transfers, all that and more on today's episode of the Formula E Zone podcast. Right, so let's talk some Formula E with enough enough waiting now. Joining me once again, Jack. It, it's great to talk to you again, mate. I'm really looking forward to this one. Welcome back. It's been two Thank you. <laughs> really, I would say, difficult episodes. Obviously, we've missed you greatly, but um, it's glad to have your your luscious tones back with us for the um, foreseeable future. <laughs> luscious, that's a new one. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much, mate. Um, Tobias, we're also talking to you tonight. Um, have you got anything nice to say? <laughs> <laughs> it's good to have you back. And your luscious of tones back on this podcast. How, how were the exams? <laughs> I'm sure everyone wants to know. You know, you yes. did your exams. That's why I want you wasn't here. So how um, were they? Uh, uh, look, let's put it this way. Uh, I'm I'm glad they're over. Um, yes, I, I think we'll leave it at that. But but thanks, boys. Um, this should be fun. We've got some some juicy topics to talk about tonight. But first, let's do a little bit of a breakdown of the Berlin E Prix round ten of the championship. It is, and we're really getting to the business end of the season now. But as always, we will start with qualifying and you know we don't want to bore you with the full details of qualifying but the things I took away once again from qualifying was Nissan's one lap pace that looked absolutely mega but also out of nowhere the HWA cars both of them making it into Super Bowl Van Dorn on the front row once again Jack did you enjoy qualifying were you surprised what, what did you take away from it um, it was good to see the HWA cars like progressing, and I think they're starting to get a, a hold on the series, which might be scary um, going into season six when they become Mercedes. Uh, we don't. I'm not saying I don't want another series dominated by Mercedes, but um, you never know. That's that's what the, the HWA are building up to. They're learning, so all of their stuff that they're doing right now will help help Mercedes going into season six. And I think they've been showing signs like Van Dorm has been, you know, in Super Bowl a few times and been in the top ten of the grid. Like he's his qualifying's improved and, and for Paffitt to finally get a lap together and actually, you know, qualify P four, um, was really interesting. Um, for me still group one, we had Robin Frines, um, in last. We had Andre Lotter, who I think made a mistake on his lap in group one. But Again, down in the bottom two last row of the grid, those two, which are two championship contenders, they you know they're both now like fourth and fifth in the championship. So to have them below, but obviously Lucas Degrassi making it through to Super Bowl um, via Group One, that was good. But obviously you can still see where Group One is sort of being affected, and those championship leaders um, starting towards back. So that was for me. That was the main thing for qualifying. Obviously, Bawemi, um, Bawemi on pole for Nissan. Um, which was nice to see Bawemi back at the top end of the field. Um, so, yeah, that was that was it for qualifying for me. But can I just bounce in there and say that I wasn't surprised by HWA up that far on the grid. I feel like I've been saying it for ages that those guys really have have figured out qualifying ever since, I, I think that was the Santiago race. I think that was bit where... Van Dorn first showed real promising pace in quali. HWA just is lacking their race pace. It's not a matter of efficiency, and I asked Van Dorn that very question last weekend in Berlin. It's not a ma matter of efficiency or not being able to, yes, yeah, save the battery or whatever. It's just a matter of outright race performance. However, on well, yeah, one lap runs in qualifying, right. HW have always been fantastic this year. I feel. Yeah, I agree. You are right. Like they have, you know, they've not they've they've sort of from the first race of the season they've consistently gotten better. So like it was bound that you know a performance like this in Berlin was bound to happen because they kept growing, they kept getting better and better every race. So yeah, it wasn't a massive surprise because I think we've seen it a few times. I think Van Dorn got pole once. Um, so it's not a massive surprise. So yeah, for me, HWA yep. have been moving in the right direction. 
Absolutely. And we have to also to talk about Andre Lotterer. He said he made a mistake on his on his qualifying lap. He did a major mistake before his qualifying lap even started. Disaster for Diaz the Cheetah, who sent out Andre Lotterer a bit too late, which meant that he only finished his 200 kilowatt warm-up lap and then tried to make his way onto his 250 lap. But because Lucas de Grassi, uh, he didn't really break check him uh, on his warm up lap or out lap, but he kind of braked, and that meant both Van and Lotra, who were behind de Grassi at that point, uh, had to break as well and slow down, which ultimately, uh, ultimately meant de Grassi and Van were able to start their laps, but Lotra wasn't. He crossed the line about a tenth of a second too late. He lashed out after the race against de Grassi, saying, well, he knew what he was doing, and he knows how to... <laughs> he was kind of accusing him of, of deliberately slowing him down and trying to, me- to force him into, his, into the position he ended up in. I wouldn't necessarily agree, because that's just... An operational and administrative disaster. You can easily change that by just sending your driver out earlier. And we've seen that happening with Diaz de Cheetah earlier before. Remember Marrakesh 2018 when I think that was one of the first times we saw Jean Eric Verne in, in Super Bowl. And he missed and, the red um, light. They didn't send him out. He in time. missed. Exactly. He, d- he missed the he green light. It went red at the end of the pit lane. That's right which meant he didn't even start his lap. And practically the same happened with Lotra this time out in Berlin. <sighs> yeah, disastrous qualifying for him. And after that happened, he practically had no chance for the race. Um, ultimately retired. I might spoil that uh, that as well now. Uh, retired with an overheating battery halfway through the race. So yeah, uh, he looked promising in practice on Friday, but... Saturday was just a disaster for him. What? How? How? How did you think the team sort of fared? Because obviously Berlin was weird. It was the first ever um, event which crossed over two days. So, you know, what do you, I don't know if you had a chance to speak to any of the teams while you were there, Tobias. Like, how did the order drivers like? Was it a different approach? Did they have time to mull over what they'd learned over practice because they still had the two practice sessions and trying to try and improve the car setup? Was it? more like a conventional motorsport weekend that weekend or was it um normal former mm. service like it's all pretty wacky kind of a thing in between these two so teams obviously had a lot more time to really go into depth with all their data analysis after the two practice sessions i felt the teams had one of the the best maybe race strategies because they could just mull over their data and and have a closer look at everything um they didn't over analyze of course that's easy to do you have plenty of time overnight you can analyze each and every meter the car has driven on friday but that's just too much because in a race situation anything can happen and all data that you've analyzed and the entire strategy that you've come up with can be thrown out of the window by, I don't know, being spun around or whatever. Uh, So teams made use of their time, but they got some sleep. I think the most difficult part of the two-day format was the drivers and them having not set any left times before quality. You know, FP2 ended at 6 in the evening... Yeah. And qualifying started at 8.45 in the morning the next day. So on one hand, the track conditions were were completely different to what they experienced in FP2, as well as them not having set... or them having not set any laps beforehand also played a major role in that. So yeah, the, the, the teams were able to go through their data a bit, that's true. But the most difficult part of it was the drivers not having set any lap times before going into qualifying. Apart from that, it felt like a usual Formula week- weekend. The schedules still were packed with two autograph sessions, for example, and drivers having to run from one event to the next. There was the e-race happening as usual. There were, as I said, autograph sessions, sponsorship events, and the the volume of all their appointments were larger in Berlin. 
So it still felt like the hectic FE race day we usually experience trackside. And there was sorry, just <laughs> this might be a bit much, but there was the Green Tech Festival as well, wasn't there? Was was that was there a mm. lot to do with that over the weekend, or was it just in the background sort of thing? So this um, is me being nosy. Sorry for the drivers. <laughs> that, no, no, no. For the drivers, it was in the background, but the entire e village basically was turned into festival ground for the Green Tech Festival exhibition. Sorry. Okay. Uh, organized by none other than Nico Rosberg. And, um, yeah, th- they had um, th- the, the Pin in Farina car, for example, the fastest road car, electric road car, nonetheless, uh, being it, exhibited there. Is that there. the one developed by the, Mahindra? That's right, or yeah. We, we, with, we, with Nick Heidfeld, with, yeah. Yeah, and with Mahindra, yeah. Ab- absolutely, yeah. Um, they had air taxis being there, not flying, sadly, but you could <laughs> sit like in them and have taxis. a look around. I was like, wow, um, what is this? I was expecting, you know what I was having? And this is really bad on a podcast, but when you have a London, when you live in London and you've got the London black cab, now I know it's probably icon, but all I saw when you said air taxis was a flying <laughs> London black cab. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's been more like a helicopter sort of thing. They call it Volocopter, so if anyone wants to look that up, that up Volocopter is the company. And also, there were e scooters and just. Oh, what else? Public transport solutions, just generally visions for a greener, cleaner, and more efficient future. And the entire e village has been a merger of the old FE village as well as this sort of futuristic exhibition forward slash conference happening there. On Friday nights, there were awards given out by um, Nico Rosberg, of course, another panel of a few experts. Um, popular actors were there from Germany and all across the world. Nena was there. Um, what's her song in English? 99 Red, Red Balloons. She was there. And um, the Crown Prince of Norway was in attendance. So we had a lot of celebrities trackside. And um, yeah, that really... When you were walking through the through the village... As a fan, you really felt the presence of of the Green Tech uh, Green Tech exhibition. Not so much for the drivers, though. They were focused on on the yeah. matters on track. Yeah. Well, that's awesome. Thanks for that, man. Um, <laughs> again, I'll, I'll just be in there, <laughs> but that's yeah, that's a really unique insight. So, thank you very much. But I th- we'll, we'll go back to the racing. <laughs> um, so, <laughs> I think you know, we, we've spoken all season long about the qualifying system, and once again, I- issues arriving from that. But the race itself, it was all right. You know, it wasn't the the most chaotic race of the season, but there was plenty of overtakes. I personally quite like the circuit layout being nice and wide, plenty of overtaking opportunities. But the race at the front, I mean, the first lap itself was, was pretty clean for a Formula E race, but the race at the front was also decided pretty early on. Lucas de Grassi working his way up from third on the grid, overtaken Sebastian Buemi very easily. Um, Jack, I know you were saying just before we started the podcast that that Nissan car just in the race just doesn't seem to have the same sort of pace it does in qualifying. Yeah, it's qualifying pace, obviously, that's where um, the dual dual motor system um, comes comes into effect and you can see when they just get those massive accelerations and that's what the drivers were saying when they were basically taking the mick in Park Ferme out of Sebastian Buemi. Well, it's only because you accelerated out that last corner and you gained two temps on everyone else because of your the car's powertrain um, is the only reason why you got pole. Um, but it just... I think um, Nissan have shown this in all the races. I think they've got a great qualifying car and they do have a good race car. Like, their race car ain't bad. It's like, it's a top five car, like top five finishing car. But the reason why they, you know, okay, maybe podium because Bohemi did get on the podium. But the reason why Bohemi hasn't won a race, or maybe even Roland, yes, they've made mistakes. You can say, you know, Roland binned it, Bohemi binned it. But they were under pressure because their car doesn't seem to be as efficient. So if you're not like Degrassi was, wasn't really under pressure once he got past, you can manage the race. But if you're, you've, if you've got a driver right behind you in Formula E and you're managing energy and and they've got more energy than you. It's 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 much easier to make a mistake, or you've just got to let them through. And you, obviously, a racing driver doesn't want to um, doesn't want to give up the position. But um, I feel like 
their efficiency problems are basically what's the main reason now Nissan haven't won a race this season. That's true, yeah. Especially, the uh, thing about Berlin is the circuit really suited three teams in particular. On the one hand, Nissan. Berlin had a lot of slow hairpin-ish corners, uh, out of wi uh, after which uh, we had longer straights following. So that's really where, where the Nissan were shining. But on the other hand, Berlin really, or in Berlin really, efficiency is key. So that suited the BMWs and the Audis and the DS to Cheetahs as well. So practically four teams, uh, all having Berlin as kind of their, or, the, or having Berlin as the track most suited to them, if that makes any sense. And we saw that happening. Nissan were incredibly strong in qualifying but then kind of had to back off. They weren't terrible in the race, but they s they still had to back off a bit. Meanwhile, we saw Audi and Lucas de Grassi with a textbook drive, and you said he, he was driving past Buemi and Van Dorn, and after that, it looked like smooth sailing for him. And um, I wrote a piece about him just today, or a couple of paragraphs about him just today, saying that, his Berlin performance really was textbook driving. If you were to write a book about how to win a Formula E race, this race could fill the entire book. Because he moved past the car the cars he battled against with just the right amount of aggression. Still fair, but just the right amount of aggression. Didn't risk anything out of the ordinary and um, then built a grab gap of around one and a half seconds and then managed it and managed his energy, managed his tires. Uh, he didn't waste any energy. That's the fear drivers always have because if you overtake the leader and are taken over P1, you could have much more pace than the guys behind you. Oh, that, although driving away doesn't make any sense in Formula E because if there's a safety car or full course, um, maybe not a full course yellow, but if there's a safety car, all your advantage is gone and you've wasted your energy. And that's exactly what Lucas de Grassi didn't do. He didn't waste his energy and after he moved past, he built a gap, a, a comfortable gap of around one and a half seconds. He could have gone up to eight seconds, in my opinion, uh, looking at, at the sector times, but um, what I, I think I'm trying to say is that he really drove a clever a race, a smart race and a race with a lot of experience and you really felt that he has, he's one of the drivers with the most experience in Formula E and um, he really was able to show that in Berlin after overtaking Buemi as I said and then just driving a clever race and bringing the car home um, not trying anything special apart from maybe the attack mode activations he was not too conservative on those, but apart from that, Degrassi really impressed me. And as I say, textbook drive in Berlin. Yeah, well, I, I fully agree. Um, it, like you say, just so controlled. And considering it's been a difficult year for Audi as well, it really did. If, I mean, if this was the only race you had seen all season, you would have thought Audi are walking it. They really did seem that good. And, you know, Degrassi, like you say, he was out in front and behind... I feel a lot of the drama from the race was coming from the two HWAs falling through the field, but also the attack mode zone. I just wanted to quickly talk about this because obviously it's a huge talking point over this entire season. But I think for me, I'm interested to see what you two think, but this is one of my favourite attack mode zones. It's right up there with Marrakesh. My personal favourite ones are the ones where they have to lose a few positions first or there's at least the potential to, and then they've got to gain them back before they can really get any performance. But I just quickly wanted to ask you guys what you thought about it, because I thought, you know what, I, I really enjoyed it. To be fair, like, attack mode in Berlin was probably the best way, and I think it was it sort of linked into the fact where it was on the outside of a long sweeping corner where you would actually lose time. And in Berlin, you had the opportunity because the track is so wide. Um, and to do places like that so you'd actually lose time because you know we saw in Monaco and Rome where the attack mode they didn't really lose any time you know in Rome they probably lost about eight tenths of a second in Monaco they didn't lose a thing in my opinion they just went out and just shot back in they didn't lose anything so there was like 
he was like, you're going into attack mode, but you're not, you know, you're getting all the benefits, but you're not getting the pain of taking attack mode. Yeah. And attack mode should be about taking pain rather <laughs> than just all benefit. Um, and I've had a lot of people talk about attack mode or where could we put attack mode. And even I, I've been, you know, been umming and ahhing about where could I put attack mode in Monaco. And I, I don't agree with the pit lane. Yes, you would have lost a lot of time by going through the pit lane, but you can't race through the pit lane, so you have to put the pit lane speed limiter on. So you're going to lose about 15 seconds, which is great, but you're never going to get that time back up, I suppose. Um, in, well, I suppose everyone would have to take it, but um, with the power deficit, you wouldn't, you know, you'd be full so far down the field that, you know, you wouldn't really overtake anyone because the cars are so close together. If you go through the pit lane on the speed lane limiter, everyone's going to go past you. So, I didn't agree with that, but I think some tracks are really difficult for Formula E to, like, properly, and I think Monaco really stood out, um, to really implement attack mode. And you won't have luxuries like Berlin um, at every race where you can do that. And so I think for me, next season, I don't, I don't want it to be like a joker lap, in a sense, like in Rallycross, where they have to do some mini obstacle course to, like, slow them down, and that forces them to lose more positions because it's much slower than what they would normally do um, but I feel like sometimes f I feel like for some tracks I don't know what else Formula E could do in order to stop attack mode being no pain because it has to have some pain you have to it's that whole point of can I take the attack mode without losing a position uh, and getting away with it because sometimes you don't. And what I loved about Berlin is that it made Turn 7 so interesting because they were right on the limit. And then people were just swerving across, you know, undertaking. It was brilliant. Going into the action, going into Turn 7 was fantastic, caused by the attack mode. So, I don't know. It's, I think it worked really well. But, you know, a lot of fans and a lot of people are like, oh, I really want more of this. But it's... It's difficult to say you want more of this because not every track is like that. So I think Formula E might have to come up with a really clever way of trying to implement attack mode so there is pain like that because that is when attack mode works. But if you go to a track like Monaco, let's say we go to Bern, like, and you know it's not really a, a fantastic attack mode place because of the layout, then you've got to think of an imaginative way to make attack mode interesting like that in Berlin at every race. I've read that former is trying to look more at the sort of hybrid circuits in the next few years. That's all rumors for now and nothing's been confirmed. But I've read over the last weeks uh, and, and days, not weeks, but over the last days, that former is looking at sort of, yeah, you know, mergers between traditional street circuits as well as kind of normal race courses so a bit like berlin it's easy to implement attack zones or maybe even joker lap sort of things in berlin as well in london next year um, we might see something happening in london uh in season six um there might be a couple of surprises coming up for berlin as well but we'll have to stay tuned wink wink uh, about the layout next year um but yeah so so Berlin really is, would be a fantastic opportunity imp to implement something like a Joker lap. Although I have to agree, turn six, the attack mode was an amazing location. I, When I walked the track on Thursday, I tried to measure how long it was, how far it was off the ideal line. I didn't like have, have any, anything good to measure <laughs> it with, apart from that just wheel, walking the distance. Um, I didn't bring my ruler, sadly. Yeah, no, so all that. yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so it, it's about it's been about twenty meters off the ideal line, and teams were expecting around one point eight seconds in in time lost. In the end, on average, it was one point three seconds, so a bit better. I, I've seen a couple of drivers losing less than a second. One point uh, zero point nine seconds, I think, was the best time by any driver uh, lost by on their attack mode activation lap um, but also somewhere some took two seconds so yeah it was really spread out on average 1.3 seconds as I said um, and I have to agree the attack mode activation zone really was placed in an ideal location in Berlin um, 
a Joker lab would have been fun as well, but that would have been controversial anyway. It is kind of controversial in Rallycross as well. It's kind of become the norm in Rallycross, but it still raises questions of maybe being a bit artificial, and we all know about that. Um, but for now, I've also been really happy with the attack mode activation zone in Berlin. And um, yeah, we'll have to see about where they put it for for Bern and uh, for New York because those circuits are a bit more difficult with their attack mode activation. So as New York might, I mean, it's practically in in a harbor, so you can think about creative ways there. But Bern really will be difficult because the circuit is really narrow, very steep as well. Um, so the circuit itself is going to be interesting. And then also the question of where to put the attack mode activation zone. I can't really think of any any good spots to put it, to put it in in Switzerland. Um, yeah, we'll have to see about that. But I agree, Berlin, the the, the location of it was great. Yeah. What what I want to just jump in on with your wink wink thing. I, mean, I I have a feeling I know what you're talking about, but at the same time I'm not gonna like spoil it at the same time because I have I have no idea, but I'm just assuming. Um, Because I know a lot of people have been talking about Berlin, about changing the track layout every year because it's on an airport surface. And you could change the track layout every year to make it completely interesting. It's like a new track every year that we go to. But I feel like that's a dangerous, like, precedent to set. And I don't know, I don't know personally as a racer, well, I say as a racer, but as a racing fan, I wouldn't like (laughs) to go to Berlin and have a different track each season. I really wouldn't. Um... Simply because I feel like, but despite the track location, the track builds up an identity. Okay, it builds up a character. Okay, and if we keep Absolutely, changing yeah. Berlin, because it's on, because you've got that advantage of you know using making as many track variants as we want. And I know technically we have changed it because season one we ran a different layout entirely, but this layout works much more better than does, the first yeah. layout did. So they changed it for the better, and I really like this layout. Okay, maybe it could be improved, but I feel like maybe over time. But I I don't want to see a new layout every year in Berlin because then I feel like you go to you go to racetracks and it's you know it's similar. Monaco hasn't changed much in its you know period. You these street tracks as Formula E grows up, and if we still going to these some of these cities and racing on some of these tracks, you know we would have been racing on those tracks for like fifteen twenty years with like minor changes but if we're going to change berlin every year or make modifications to berlin every couple of years i just feel like that takes its that um that specialness out yep. of of that event if that makes sense um i, I don't agree. know yeah this it's an argument but i know a lot of people have been oh how cool would it be if we but for me it's not cool but that's my opinion but you know i think you yep. should be skeptical about those sort of things i have no idea if that's what you're about could be completely different <laughs> yeah but i know that's been in the news lately and i know a lot of people have been talking about it so i thought so as you were giving a wink wink and i was thinking i wonder if that wink wink is because of that i was like hmm. let me just i thought it just as soon as you said it i was like i think i know what he's on about and it just struck a nerve and i was like just you know what just say it <laughs> yes i sadly can't really talk about much no um, i'm not expecting you to from but, what i've um, heard yeah but I, I have to agree, in, in in principle, circuits develop personalities. And you think about the Singapore Grand Prix in, in F1. That's a street course as well. And it's pretty much been unchanged for the last, how long has it been? 10 years, 11 years, apart from the, the Singapore, Singapore sling. sling. Yeah. And uh, they spot? changed the bridge as well. Uh, so the, yeah. whatever the name of the bridge was, the after Anderson the bridge. Singapore Sling. The Anderson Bridge, yeah, that's right. They they the changed to the, the other side of the road. Yep. Or am I yep. just talking about a rubbish bridge that I don't know what I'm on about? <laughs> no, I think you I think that's the right bridge, yeah. Yeah, anyway, so so Singapore really hasn't lost its its character and its its personality, and I think that's important too. I I agree that circuits should keep their personalities and I'm sure Berlin won't really change its personality as well. In uh, the layout, of course, is different nowadays compared to the days of 2015 and season one. But you still, if if you look very closely, you can still see some resemblance uh, between these two. 
uh, two layouts of the of the course as well. Um, yeah, we'll we'll have to wait and see you know, how things pan out. I haven't seen anything, but I've I've heard things about uh, Berlin's layout and future seasons. Um, yeah, but I've also heard things about layouts for for circuits and for in in other cities as well. Um, it's all rumors at the moment, and um, we we'll, we really only have the only thing we can do is wait and see. But I agree, circuits should keep their personalities, and um, yeah, well, I'm open to change, but they should keep the characteristics of a, of a circuit. While we're, Dan, while we're on the topic of um, track layouts, I was just I just wrote down that a lot of people because Berlin was a really like bit like Mexico, Berlin. You could say Berlin is a purpose-built racetrack technically yeah. um, for like Mexico and Formula E they're like oh it's a great race it was great for overtaking oh man Formula E should make more tracks like that and I'm like no we shouldn't because now yes it was great for overtaking but Formula E's identity is street tracks it's about bringing the race to the people and Formula E can never in my opinion in its whole entire life cannot lose sight of that it can't lose sight that it's bringing races to the people so when you're a former Marie and you're you've got this city and you know you have to be when they're thinking about having a race like london for example london's really weird because it's in the xl center but the reason why it's in the xl exhibition center is because they can't find any roads to to shut london down effectively like they would like london yeah. to have it there but they can't actually find a place so you're dealing with all formula e people are dealing with all the local authorities you know it's probably similar to alexander de platz in season two for berlin um when we race there you know you're trying to find a racetrack where the local authorities will say okay you can close this little bit this section here you can have Okay, and you've got to create a racetrack within that. And some parts are going to be narrow. Some parts are going to be difficult to overtake. But that's street racing. You know, I don't... We watch Macau. And people love Macau. But there's parts of Macau where you can't overtake. There are parts of Macau where you can overtake. Okay, but there's... You know, street circuits are supposed to be narrow. Are supposed to be tight and twisty. And overtakes are supposed to be magnificent. And we've seen so many magnificent overtakes and formulas on tight twisted um streets are because we saw it in monaco where it's impossible to overtake so when i get loads of tweets and fans saying on twitter that oh we want these nice big you know tracks so they can have overtakes i said like, we don't need it yeah we can have one or two racetracks like this this is what i was talking to degrassi about and he agreed he's like we can have one or two or three races which are sort of permanent racetracks which sort of give us that difference that we can overtake a bit like mexico but we can't lose sight of, you know, Formula E being a street circuit racing and having those tight and twisty um, street circuits. Yeah, for the most part, I agree with you. Not fully. <laughs> but, it's but fun. The, Tell me where I'm wrong. For the wrong. most part. Well, I see, I, I really, en- I'll, I'll just get out of the way. You know, I, I really enjoyed this race. And I think the last couple of years, you could argue it's been a race dominated by Audi but at the same time I look back at both of them I think they were really good races but what I mean for the most part is that I find I have this conversation in Formula 1 all the time and it's the same with Formula E I like it when the calendar's all a little bit different I I fully agree with you and I know when we both went to Rome we had a conversation about the Mexico race that is that a purpose-built circuit well it is but it's in the city centre but I just like the fact that it's, they don't have to be on the road, if that makes sense. Like we've got the airport here in Germany. We have the purpose-built circuit in Mexico, and just as long as there's variety across the calendar, I'm fine with it. I'm not really fussed if it's a street circuit, if, if you want to call it that. So I think, mo- like I say, mostly I agree with you, if that makes sense. But I don't know. I'm I'm more intrigued to see what they do with future circuits. Because obviously I, I'm guessing, and as Toby just alluded to again, um, we're going to have more circuits join next season and perhaps we could see the biggest calendar ever in Formula E. But also you look at races like Paris, where, again, apology, I, I can't remember his name, but one of the, I think it was the mayor for Paris or the equivalent. A candidate, of a, a candidate for, for mayor. They have re-elections yeah. next year and 
the current mayor is all in favor of Paul Marie. She's the, practically the one responsible for bringing FE to f- to France. But a candidate for the for the office in Paris, he yeah, that's the one you're talking about. Yeah, yeah, he doesn't want it, does he? And and people are supporting him for that. So I think that's where they've got to be careful, Formula E, because they've spoken many times about having these core countries they want to go to, which I get completely but just as long as there's a mix i'm cool with it and i don't mind where we go to be totally honest with you but i think yeah i think we're all on a similar sort of line there i believe (laughs) unless i'm talking (laughs) nonsense again no you're not um we are indeed looking at larger calendars for the next few years so there's always potential for new cities um the plan is to increase the amount of races we're seeing to around 15 possibly 16 in the next three or so years okay. um next start uh, next year we're bringing in london as well as possibly seoul although i've heard about lots of chaos in south korea and nobody knowing anything about the race yeah. there <laughs> um i've read a report sadly it's it's dating back to to march so it's not the the most of recent reports but uh, I've read a report from a South Korean motorsport, ma- or not motorsport, but automobile magazine, and just a journalist, he was asking around about the person in charge and the company in charge of, of organizing and promoting the race there, um, and he was asking around at the police stations who should be responsible for, for locking the streets, and, and um, yeah, just general local authorities spoke to the city government of seoul and nobody has even heard about formerly there um that was the case in march i've read about and e formerly e shameless self-plug we've written a story about seoul in april in which alejandro agak said that they've already found found and finalized layout so it sounds really messy in South Korea. I wouldn't go as far as saying we are definitely going to Seoul in season six, but that's the general idea of where we're looking to be in the next few years. So around fifteen races in the next few years, uh, leading up to Generation Three of Formula E. Yeah, and you, um, you know what Seoul sounds like. Seoul sounds like you know when we release the calendar, and the calendar will be released soon. This time next month. Well, I suppose this podcast will go out in a couple of days' time, but this time next month you know the world's most sport council will be meeting to ratify the calendar the calendar for formula e will be published um from that meeting so we will everyone will know where we're going essentially and if there's a tba slot like we have seen quite a few times like sanya this year was a tba slot um there could be a tba slot which could be sold because it might not be actually finalized um, so we might have to wait a bit longer to find out what that TBA slot could be. So if we do see one of those, maybe we can assume that might be Seoul. Um, but yeah, from what, and I've seen the reports, because I remember Tobias mentioning it to me on um, a couple of days ago. Um, so yeah, I looked at him and I was like, yeah, it sounds like it's going to be a TBA race. There's no, there's no, <laughs> or, because yep. the, the formerly fell into that trap before in like season one and season two. I feel more season one where they released a calendar and then those races fell off the calendar. So in order to avoid that mishap, they just put a TBA to be announced. And I suppose there's no, if, the, if it never gets announced, then at least we, no one technically knew where it was. <laughs> so, you know, it was sort of, could happen, could not happen. Whereas it's bad to say, "Oh, we're going here," and then, "Oh, we're actually we're not." Um, but yeah, yeah, and it's not only the race calendar which is interesting for the next few years. Sorry, Dan, I'm I'm taking over your job, ah, but we also <laughs> we also have to look at, at drivers moving, uh, possibly from one team to the next. Um, slowly but surely, the silly season is starting, and. Uh, yeah, it's 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 really starting. The first pieces of the puzzle are falling into place. Um, we've seen so far four drivers being, or three drivers being officially confirmed, and the fourth one practically confirmed in in media reports, but not officially by the team. So we've we've heard about Venturi continuing on with Mortara and Massa. We've heard about Porsche going for Neil Jani. And we've heard about Mitch Evans staying at Jaguar. Um, Just to bite in very quickly, it was quite interesting you say Mortara, because I read a report about two days ago 
that Van Dorn said that um, his seat for Mercedes technically wasn't secure because Mercedes were considering Mortara. Hmm. Interesting. I've I've heard about Mortara and Massa or Venturi both re-signing both Mortara and Massa. I know. I heard the same. Yeah, I thought they were sticking with the same lineup. Yeah, I know Massa has a two-year con or has signed a two-year contract last year, so he he still had one year left in his contract. And I've heard that Mortara is staying as well. But there's a lot of other other drivers moving around possibly as well. First and foremost. And he's going to be key for the driver market, Daniel Apt. Yeah, this one was interesting because when we spoke to him in Berlin, um, he said that his future is not in his hands, which basically means he can do. There's nothing he can do apart from race as hard as he can and score as many posi- uh, race positions as possible um, to try and save his seat at Audi. To me, he's trying to save his seat at Audi. He's not trying to. Um, but when you say he's out of his hands and he said that um, what did he say I'm trying to remember what he said he said that highlights okay he hasn't had enough highlights compared hmm. to Degrassi Degrassi's won 10 races Apps won 2 um, should have won 3 um, you know Apps had 1 pole position Degrassi's had 3 Degrassi's won a title Apps not really been anywhere near to winning a title and I think that's what he's saying is coming to bite him now is that Audi probably want two drivers that can fight for a title, and Apt hasn't shown that. And but personally, I think Apt has done enough to warrant a place. Maybe not with Audi, but definitely in Formula E. I think he's, a, you know, he's been consistent point scorer in eight of the ten races so far. So he's a driver who's quite reliable and will score points. And for some teams in Formula E, consistency is where consistency is key. Having a driver that consistently finishes in the points. Is a, is a good bet to have. So where should he go? If it's not Audi, where where do you see him next year? There's many places. There's many places. Dragon, possibly. Um, that would be a step down. Dragon? Oh. Dragon. Well, the thing is, where would he go? Where would he go? So now this is with the oh. open. So you'd assume Nissan, Bohemian, and Roland, right? You'd assume Virgin, yeah. Sam and Friends. I, I know he's an Audi powertrain, but... I can't see Virgin getting rid of those two drivers. Um, they've both done amazingly. So no room at Virgin, no room at Tech Cheetah, no room at Mercedes or Porsche. It's un- he could go to Mercedes. I'm not ruling him out of that second seat, but I think it's highly unlikely. No room at Porsche. Then you're looking at Neo, which is a proper step down. You're looking at Dragon, which is also a step down. If Venturi have confirmed, then... Uh, Mortara and Massa then there's no place there and then Jaguar the only other place you could go is Jaguar but Alex Lynn's doing a great job so if you're James Barkley you know Alex Lynn's doing a great job you've worked with him you know how he works you might as well take him and then Apt could be the first victim of a Formula E driver technically who's good enough to be in Formula E who falls out of Formula E and I'm also worried for another number of drivers like that I don't think he's the only one. I'm not saying Turvey, for example. Like, I'm, I'm mentioning Turvey. Like, Turvey could still be with Neo next season. I'm just mentioning his name because I think he's a very underrated driver. I think a lot of people acknowledge that he's very good, for example. But he's been stuck at Neo now since... Well, he's been at Neo all his career in Formula E. And That's it, right. I can't see Neo ever really... Well, they could. It's really bad for me to speculate and say I can't see Neo even, you know, being ready to compete for wins or points next season but I think it's highly unlikely and you know he could be a driver imagine if he decided to go to Neo but if he left Neo then even for Turvey he's like another driver well where do I go unless you move sideways to a team like Dragon so I think the driver market could be really interesting this season but um, I think we could start seeing drivers who you know, warrant a place in Formula E and have shown over the last couple of seasons, but because, you know, there's just no space in the inn and, you know, hmm. other teams pick other drivers from, you know, up and coming, like, for me, if Audi don't go with App, then for me, it's Nick De Vries or, as you say, Nico Muller. But I'm more looking at Nick De Vries because I'm thinking, you know, what is his chance of getting into Formula 1? He's doing quite well in Formula 2. You know, Audi have tested him in the Formula E car. So he's got Formula E sort of test knowledge, a little bit of it. 
and he's done some of the young driver day tests. So maybe they maybe they want to have a go with him. What do you think about um, Alex Sims and his season, and if he's still going to be able to mm. hold on to that seat? Because I've I've not been that impressed. He started the year quite well. You know, you think back to Marrakesh and he could have got a win if it wasn't for that little incident between the two teammates. But for me, he's <laughs> really dropped off in the second half. And I think that's one of the biggest seats that potentially is going to be available next season. Funny you should say that. I spoke to Alex about that very topic a nice. couple of days ago. <laughs> um, and he is involved in the pre-season testing of BMW. He is developing their season six car. But he specifically told me he hasn't signed a contract yet. I don't know about Antonio Felix Acosta and about his contractual situation. I would be surprised if BMW were to throw him out. Um, Yeah, and he's a BMW factory driver as well, so... Yeah, but Um, so is Sims. I would be surprised if... Because so is Sims as well. I can't see... Honest to God, I know you might say he hasn't signed the contract, but it wouldn't surprise me one bit if Sims and Acosta are together next season I think BMW's first season you know the first season has been fairly good I think they could absolutely yeah. keeping those two drivers going into season six you know that could be a big plus you know stability's been good I think stability's been good for Audi you know stability's been good for Tech Cheetah as well having Lotter and Vern you know and, and you know Lotter we could have said early season four or he's going to get kicked out but you know Lotter was really you know, come on, I think Sims might, you know, Sims has shown glimpses, you know, you can't forget Marrakesh, I know there was a mistake, but you know, he could have won that race, and he's had a bit of bad luck ever since, and I don't think, uh, I think the early qualifying rounds when he was towards the top of the championship didn't help him, Um, and maybe he lost a bit of confidence that way, because at the beginning of the season, you thought it was a two-way fight, really, between the Costa and Sims, for the title, so it looked like it, yeah. It wouldn't surprise me. I'm looking at Sims's points now. So you've got 12 points in Marrakesh. Obviously, could have been 25. Six in Santiago, but then hasn't scored until Berlin. Wow. But he had three races like where he didn't finish, where he was not classified. But he didn't score in Mexico. He didn't score in Rome, where he finished. Um, he didn't score in Monaco because he sort of crashed into the grass, so that didn't help him. And then... Six points in in Berlin, despite only picking up twenty four points, and the cost has picked up eighty two. You could say that's a big difference, and you could say you know there's 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 a there's a cause for change there, but I think stability will be key. And I, it wouldn't surprise me if they change. They change. I might be wrong. I might be talking rubbish, but it wouldn't surprise me if they go second full season in and keep the two current drivers. Wouldn't surprise me as well, no. Shall we just quickly run down the teams and um, shall we look at, at the layouts? We'll we'll make it quick. So we'll start with Audi, Lucas de Grassi. He seems at this point in time, we should add that, at this point in time, end of May, and there's still a lot, surely there'll be a lot happening in, in the next few, few weeks and months, but... Lucas de Grassi looks to be reasonably set at Audi. Daniel Apt, he has the performance, but we'll have to wait and see about him and uh, if the team decides to keep him on. Felix da Costa looks decent at BMW. Sims, as I said, involved in the de- development, but not signed a contract yet. Tachita probably will s- will stay with Van and, and Lotra. Virgin... Not sure about those guys. Um, they've been looking good so far. Um, I wouldn't change it. Um, HWA will merge or morph into Mercedes. Van Dorn looks to be set, although, as Jack said, maybe there's another option open for him as well. Same applies to Gary Paffert. I don't really see him driving for, for yeah. Mercedes yet, but we'll have to wait and see Stranger about that one as happened, well. But I think that um, seat's open. The second Mercedes seat is definitely open. Yeah, I, I agree. would say so too. Yeah, yep. Um, Neo, I think they, or personally, I think they will stay with with Turvey and Dillman. I've spoken to Tom, and he's involved in the development as well. They haven't started testing. BMW have, 
but Neo are only starting next month, month so in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, Tom Dillman will be involved and is already looking forward to driving an, a better car, as he said to me, Fingers next year. So him. it's not been confirmed on paper, but Dillman looks to be continuing It makes sense for Neo, Neo to keep those two, but, you know, it, Neo and uh, Turvey and Dillman are, are high-quality drivers. Dillman proved it when he came in and stepped into a Formula E car first time in Season 3. It's just, yep, for yeah. me, how long... How long will they stay there with it's a car that's performing? Yep, absolutely. Um, then we have Nissan with Buemi. He'll probably stay if he. <laughs> yeah, I think he will stay. If he stays in Formula E next year, he will stay at, at Edam's. Roland, he's been doing great this year. A fantastic replacement for Alex Albon. Um, would surprise me if, if Nissan Edam's was decided was to decide against him um we'll have to see about venturo we'll have to see about jaguar not sure about alex lynn evans m- possibly will stay at jaguar but we'll have to wait and see about alex lynn and that only leaves two teams open and uh, we have to talk about mahindra and of course dragon and i'll start w- with the american team they have been a mess this year so much going on behind closed doors and we only get to see glimpses of what's been happening in the background um but from what we hear dragon has been utterly cha- chaotic this year and um there's been reports in spanish media uh, from what i hear um that jose maria lopez is looking for an out as well even before going to ban um Sounds sounds ridiculous, but we might see that. Um, for now, it's only rumors, of course, and I should should add that um, it's only rumors. But Spanish media are reporting that Lopez is looking for a way out of his contract, even before we're going to Switzerland. Maximilian Gunther has been surprisingly quick this year. It's only a question of whether he wants to stay with Dragons management. They are possibly going to become a customer team next y- next year um so we might see dragon back with the venturi power train or go reverting back to Mah- i think they've they've used mahindra before as well um no i think oh, they're always venturi I'm, i can't remember i, I think i might be wrong yeah i think they've yeah, always they're been definitely with venturi. venturi they were venturi season one so season who two. was season season two sorry season two they were using the venturi power train season three i think there was then this penske thing Mm, yeah okay so i heard that they're going to be going back into the role of a customer team um so the 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 car might be better but it's a question of whether max will want to stay with the management at dragon and then then leaves open mahindra do you see dan pascal or slash and jerome staying on for next year i think for the team they'll want to keep them both i think they've both done a really strong job in a car. I think they've overachieved both of them actually. I'm I'm not that impressed with the Mahindra car. And I think they've both done a good job. Don't <laughs> don't get me wrong. It's not being completely plain sailing. And for the drivers, they have made mistakes. I think for me, maybe Pascal might look elsewhere. Mm-hmm. For, if he can try and find a seat at someone like an Audi, at maybe a BMW, someone like that. I think he might go looking for that. But it, it's a strong team. Mahindra you don't expect them to be at the back of the grid next season you expect them to be there thereabouts if they get everything right in the championship so I think they will stick with the same lineup as Jack said a minute ago I think if App stays I think that (laughs) calms down the silly season but if App (laughs) goes I think we'll just see changes galore so I I think that's more the key to it but no I think that's one of the better lineups on the grid and to be honest, it's working for them, so they don't really need to change it. I think Apt and Sims are the cork in the bottle to this season's yeah. silly season. They're the cork. If both of them go, you've got a number of drivers who will be jumping to go to either BMW or Pascal Verland, definitely 100%. He'll be jumping. German driver in either a German manufacturer, like he'll be jumping to leave him in. But can you do that as a Ferrari factory driver? Uh, well... That's Formula One. He's German. I'm sure, you know. Can Sebastian Buemi drive for Nissan? Yet yeah, he's a Toyota factory driver. Like, you know, um, 
you know, stranger things have happened. I, I'm pretty sure he'd jump it. I don't think if if a chance came for him to drive for Audi or or for for um, for BMW, I'm, I'm Pascal Verlaine will be on the phone. And as much as I like Mahindra and I respect Il Bag Gill, and I think you know he's done a great job in getting Pascal Verlaine, and I think it's a great coup for for Mahindra. Um, I expect a driver of his ability, which he's proven this season, to be jumping at the opportunity. Um, I think one thing I think I suppose we haven't talked about the race too much um, in this podcast, so I just want to I just want to circle back <laughs> towards the race. Um, but it's been obviously like amazing discussion points. But what I want to talk about there was a safety car um, in the race caused by Alex Lynn, um, his rear axle just basically locked, causing causing a safety car. Four and course, yeah. lots of drivers have been talking about the 45 minute plus one lap system and wanting to go back for a lap system and to be honest with you I had no opinion about that um, until Berlin because when we because Berlin was supposed to be this race about energy management and energy efficiency and then we had that safety car and we were stuck behind that safety car for like eight to ten minutes and I and Four energy course, management yellow went through the window and it was um, a more comfortable and but they could race faster it wasn't you could say well you know it was pretty close towards the end of the race but that's because they could go faster so they could use up the energy so there wasn't it wasn't a massive it didn't become a massive race about efficiency in, in the end which we we're hoping for and drivers have been very vocal about moving towards a lap system and it, for me it made sense because when you're watching the clock, every time a safety car comes out now, you're watching the clock and seeing how many minutes we've lost. Yes, technically you'd lose laps. I get that. You would lose laps. But the way Formula E goes in a safety car, you probably we probably lost two laps. Okay? But then they've still got to do... So say they had to do 60 laps. That's just an just imaginary number. Okay? Let's imagine they had to do 60 laps in the Berlin e Prix which would be an hour, so it's way too much. I've just like thought about it right now. Okay. If they, they lose two laps, they still have to do 60. Whereas, if they were going to do 60 laps, but now they do 40, 52, then you're in it because of the safety car. Then you've lost eight laps. Whereas they still... You've, you've lost... You've only done two laps in that period, in the time period, if you get what I'm saying. But then, you've lost eight laps of the race, technically. Whereas, if it was a lap race, you've only lost those two laps. So for me, I feel like, yeah, you have to go back to a lap system. Do you think they could just pause the timer? Do you think that would work if when, you know, a full course yellow or safety car came out, they just pressed pause? I know, <laughs> I know it sounds stupid, I don't think but do you think that would it's work? It's not fair in a sense. It's a, a good idea, but it's not fair in a sense. It's like fuel in Formula 1. You know, yeah. you're still, despite going around, the safe, going around the safety car, you're still using energy, not as much. But you're still using energy, so you can't burn fuel, and you know, and you'd have to go even slower. Like that's, uh, I think, too far to the other side. So I think, um, I think going back to a set laps, like Sebastian Buemi and half the drivers have said, and telling us what you want us to drive to, in energy, and then we have to build a car. Because at the moment, Formula e drivers and uh, drivers are saying, the engineers are not building cars to drive, to be energy efficient. They're they drive. They're building cars to drive fast because energy efficiency with this battery, with the race length, isn't important. So therefore, they're building faster cars, and that's not what Formula E should be working about. We don't need to build fast electric cars. We're doing that already, but they've got no energy life or battery life. We need to be driving that energy efficiency and building that battery life. And I don't think this current set of regulations in the in race with the race time is actually doing that. But to build battery life, you would first have to, of course, open up battery development. And if... I'm not sure if we're going to see battery development being allowed with the Generation 3 car. Maybe we only get that in Gen 4 or Gen 5. But at some point, teams and manufacturers will be allowed to develop their own batteries, and as soon as that will happen... I I agree. We would have to move back to to lap sister to to, to, to lap traces. Um, it's also a question of, in my opinion, marketing and PR. Timed races, to me, as one who's been following motorsports for a few years, 
timed races, with the exception, of course, of endurance racing, always gave me the impression of not really immature racing, but sprint racing. And I know Formula 2 does sprint races as well without using a timed format, but DTM is applying timed races, or has been applying timed races for f a few years now. And um, and um, watching the races on telly, that it always felt like, of course, the clock is ticking, and it felt like a sprint race was on. And Formula E races are sprint races, but with manufacturers trying to to create an image of their powertrains having the longevity to to last for longer periods of time, that's not r maybe not the image Formula E wants to to build and to create with their races. So from a, from a PR perspective as well, I think lap a lap system is is a bit better than timed races. It's difficult to put into words. I'm I'm not against time races as they are, but it seems yeah, a bit maybe a bit artificial and a bit immature and a bit yeah, too sprint racy, if that makes sense. Dan, how how do you yeah. think about that? No, yeah, I was just gonna say I I think I agree with you. Um I'm I'm more I'm not really too fussed, to be honest. If they keep it next season, <laughs> I'm cool with it. If they go back to laps, I'm cool with it. I, I'm very intrigued to see next season how many of these so-called, you know, if you want to call it a gimmick, that's fine. But if these gimmicks like the, the tap mode, if they change that up for next season, fan boost, well, I'm sorry, I've always got to mention fan boost, um, <laughs> <laughs> what they do with that next season. I think there's a lot of them in Formula E, and I'll, I'll be intrigued with the timer whether they change it because on a couple of occasions this year Rome in particular there's been this almost extreme artificial racing where drivers have had to really slow down just to make sure they don't have to do that one extra lap which of course yes it adds a bit of drama but for some people again is it artificial does it ruin the racing it's always something to consider and I think it's definitely been a big learning curve for Formula E this year which again it's been a brilliant season of Formula E, so don't get me wrong, but it's something I think they're definitely going to be looking at for next year. Um, we've been talking a while, uh, so I've got, you know, we want, we wanted to talk about a, a few different things, but I think we've had some really good conversations today. So I think this <laughs> is a really good place to end it this week. We, I think driver of the day, we'll, we'll skip this time. Uh, if you want to quickly you say sure? one, you can. Uh, well, did, did you, I was going to say we could potentially... All right. Change of thought then. Sure, sure, we'll, we'll sure, sure, it's your baby. Well, it is my baby. I know. What we'll do then, we'll, <laughs> we'll say a driver of the day and a classic whose championship is it now? Whose championship is it to lose? I'm going to go first because I've not been here for two weeks and I want the easy road. <laughs> um, so, driver of the day, John Eric Byrne. Awesome drive from him. A real championship drive. Um, exactly what he needs to be doing after a really difficult start to the year all of a sudden now you could argue he's in the hot seat but for me i think da costa's going to get the championship i've had this Ooh. funny feeling all feeling all season long and i just oh. have this i don't know it's, it's more of a gut feeling <laughs> than using <laughs> my head but that bmw for me has been one of the more consistent cars. De Costa has been one of the more consistent drivers, keeping his nose clean. He had a really good race this weekend, was unlucky to not be on the podium. So that's what I'm going with uh, to spice up the end of the podcast. Um, you two can fight it out. <laughs> Who goes next? I like Go on, that. Tobias. You're younger than me. Okay. Um, my driver of the day was Lucas de Grassi. I talked about him at length earlier, so I don't really have to evaluate my point, I think. He really had a textbook drive in Berlin. Really impressed me with his performance, and that is enough for, for the driver of the day title for, for me. I would say it's... Hmm, I'd be happy uh, if, if any of the top five would win it. Any of the 22, in fact. If, if they were to win it, I'd be happy about that. Um, because each and every driver really deserves to beat a champion in Formula E. But those top five drivers, and it seems to be one of these five in the end uh, who will make it, the, all of them deserve it. They've had 
amazing races this year. I'd love to see Andre Lotterer win another race in the next three races because he really deserves that as well. Um, in the end, of course, it's going to be the one with the most points. But looking at the performance, like very subjective performance over the last three races, I would have to say it's Jean-Éric Verne's title to lose now. He still has to work out hard, don't get me wrong. It's If he does one mistake in the next three rounds, he might very well drop off and um, have a hard time in winning the championship. Um, but... <laughs> As of this evening, uh, May the 30th, I'd say it's John Rank Vern's title to lose. And now you, Jack. I, I have to agree with you. For me, it's John hmm. Vern's title to lose as well. Um, he, I think the DS Check Team car is the quickest. I think he's getting the best out of it. Um, I think he's probably the best performer out there. And I'm, you know, there might be some Formula E drivers out there who will say, how can you say that? But I think for me... Um, Vern has just been stunning over these last couple of races, and and I think he'll still be stunning in the in the next couple. I think he definitely has to be the favourite. For me, I feel well, driver of the day now. Driver of the day is going to be difficult. I'm going to give it to Stoffel. Um, I think great qualifying performance, not a bad race performance for Stoffel Van Dorn. Um, so yeah, I'm going to go for Stoffel Van Dorn. Awesome stuff. Um, well. That's your lot from episode nine of the Formula E Zone podcast. We really do hope you did enjoy. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe to the Formula E Zone YouTube channel. Go and follow us over on Twitter. And if you've got any questions or any queries, please feel free to contact us. Formula E Zone is always smashing it with its Formula E news, stories, features. It's been a pleasure working with them for this season. And hopefully we will be doing so for many, many more Thank you guys for listening and we'll see you next time in Bern.